first I've been asked to do metallurgy for the blacksmith. So I'm going to try and start out with some intro to metallurgy and just try to lay down some basics for everyone before we go into heat treatment. So we have a little bit of understanding of what's going on microstructurally within our, our parts when we're heat treating. So we're going to start out by looking at the iron carbon phase diagram. This is kind of the, the basis to a large portion of metallurgy and especially when working with ferrous alloys. So just starting, starting at the beginning and along the X axis, this is where we're gonna be in weight percent carbon. So if you look at the very left side, it's zero, that's 100% iron. And as you move to the right, you're getting higher in carbon concentration, lower in iron concentration. As you move vertically along the Y axis, this is gonna be in our, our temperature scale. As we vary the temperature that we have our bar of steel at, we're gonna change the microstructural constituents that are present within the bar. I'm gonna review those in just a second here. Throughout, I'm gonna try my best to speak in Fahrenheit. A lot of my work over the last couple of years has been completely within the scientific community and we operate on Celsius. So please excuse me if I struggle with some temperatures. Really what I wanna start with is talking about cooling steels from the liquid, because really that's where we always start with our microstructure and really sets up the basis for where we're gonna succeed. We're gonna look at kind of a, a lower carbon steel around 0.02% carbon, just for simplicity's sake. As we cool from the liquid, we form what's called a delta ferrite phase. This is the same microstructure as our low temperature ferrite and really does not serve a very useful everyday purpose. Delta ferrite is really only of interest in academia and is very rarely present at uh, room temperature equilibrium conditions and having it remain around is very difficult to occur. And typically through uh, the steel production process, delta ferrite gets broken up and heavily distributed throughout the microstructure to the point where it's so fine you can't find it. As we continue to cool and drop below about 2600 Fahrenheit, where you enter into austenite. This is our, our high temperature phase of steel that's really important. And we're gonna talk about austenite several times today because austenite really is where we start to set up for our properties in our heat treated part, where we start to set up for everything that we have going forward in terms of our microstructure and our mechanical properties. This is also sometimes referred to as the gamma phase. As we can, and it's a really broad phase field. I mean, it covers a wide range of temperatures and a very broad range of uh, carbon contents. There's a high solubility of carbon present in austenite, all the way up to 2% carbon. And that's really helpful for us in terms of being able to achieve different properties in steels, different hardnesses, toughnesses, strengths, as well as as we alter the composition of our steels and start adding other elements, we can actually change the size of this austenite phase field. And that is really what changes what kind of quench medium we might be using. It's going to change overall properties that we can achieve. For example, stainless steel alloys and the 300 series are an austenitic alloy. That means at room temperature, austenite is the stable phase. There's so much chrome present in an alloy that this austenite region actually expands well down here to room temperature and is present over, I think it's uh, about 13 to 17% chrome. So that, that's an aside. Um, I work a lot in stainless steels right now. So we're gonna keep cooling down in our basic iron carbon. As we move below this tie line here, we're moving into a two-phase region. And in this two-phase region, we have still austenite present as well as ferrite. So whenever you have kind of a triangular region present in a phase diagram, you're gonna have the microstructural constituents of the bordering sides. So austenite being one and ferrite over here on the left being the other. Ferrite has a small ability for to keep carbon in solution. And so we don't see ferrite occurring by itself above 0.02%. 
ferrite is a constituent of what we really see at room temperature. So as we continue to cool towards room temperature, the austenite that remains in our two-phase field is going to cool as well, and we're going to form, start forming cementite and ferrite out of that final austenite to the transform. And that ferrite and cementite combination is what is typically referred to as perlite. Perlite is not a phase in itself. Perlite is a description of how the ferrite and cementite are oriented in relationship to each other in the microstructure. So a quicker recap with less detail. As we cool down from high temperature, we're going to see the formation of austenite. As we cool from austenite, we're going to start forming our ferrite and cementite. And what you guys might have noticed at this point is we haven't formed any martensite and martensite isn't displayed on this diagram. And that's because this is the equilibrium iron carbon phase diagram. So this is what's going to happen when you're cooling at moderately slow cooling rates and you're giving time to allow for diffusion to occur. Martensite is the transformation that will occur when you're going from austenite down to room temperatures at very fast rates, fast enough rates that you're not allowing for diffusion, which is movement of carbon through, this, through the steel microstructure. And that rapid cooling forces what's called a kinetic transformation. And so it's literally a shear movement in the austenite structure that transforms us to our martensite crystal structure. We'll talk a little bit about martensite later on. Um, I don't want to confuse too much with it too early. So our equilibrium microstructures, we're going to again be cooling down from the austenite phase field. And first off, we're going to start cooling here at what's called the eutectoid composition. So as we cool down from austenite, you'll notice we're not going through another two phase field as before. We're cooling directly into our ferrite plus cementite region. And this is where we form what's called perlite. And in this center micrograph, this is all a completely perlitic microstructure. You'll notice there's in, uh, kind of layers or plates, and these are referred to as lamellae of perlite. So we have in our white is our ferrite microstructure, and the dark etched microstructure is the cementite. And together, they make what's referred to as perlite. Because when you look at this in the light optical microscope, it gives kind of a, a choiescence or a pearlescence uh, that you would see on a, on a pearl or um, an opal. So, but really, it's a, the mixture of the white and black etchant and the really fine, thin layers that give you uh, an interesting reflection optical illusion. Um, the other thing to notice here in this microstructure is that we've got a variation of widths in the perlitic lath. So down here in the bottom right, we see really broad bands of ferrite and cementite, whereas in the upper right corner, we have very narrow banding between the cementite and the ferrite. And really what that is, is if you think of a stack of papers, if you cut the papers perpendicular to the surface, you're gonna have your true spacing. But if you were to cut through at an angle, you're going to get a, a bias and it's gonna look like there's a broader spacing between your perlite. Really where this comes into effect for a blacksmith is some of your perlitic spacing can really influence the strength of even just a, a slowly cooled piece of steel. Um, you're gonna have a finer grain structure and a finer perlitic spacing, which ultimately can increase some of your strengths while still maintaining ductility. Now, if we look to the left of that, as we cooled down previously, when we cool into that two-phase region that I was trying to describe earlier of austenite and ferrite, in this two-phase region, we form that ferrite, and it's gonna form along the grain boundaries of austenite. So that's what we're seeing with these large packets of white here that form uh, a bit of a geometric shape. That's the ferrite nucleating on the austenite grain boundary. And as we cool, as I mentioned before, 
ferrite does not have the ability to hold carbon in solution above 0.02%. So as the ferrite's forming, it is literally kicking carbon into the center sections and increasing the local carbon concentration over here to the carbon concentration of the eutectoid. And so as you drop and the carbon concentration increases as temperature is decreasing, and as you drop below the eutectoid temperature, everything in the center here has the carbon concentration of the eutectoid. And so therefore we form that perlite lamella in between. And that's kind of in the center of our grains. So if we look to the right at a hyper eutectoid microstructure, this is what we're gonna be seeing more in a, a, a higher carbon tool steel. And in this case, we're kind of looking at um, a more generic 1000 series high carbon tool steel that's been cooled from austenite into this austenite cementite phase field where my cursor is showing. So what's forming along the austenite grain boundaries is again, in this case, cementite is uh, in part etching as white along part of the austenite grain boundaries. And that's a feature of the, the etchant. And then it was held there to allow the cementite to form because cementite requires the fusion of carbon. So it, we need to wait a little bit and then it's cooled below the eutectoid temperature and we form packets of perlite, but it's cooled rapidly enough below the eutectoid temperature that we actually start to see the formation of some laths of martensite, that they're these kind of sharp, thin and elongated needle-like formations in the center of the microstructure. And that's our martensite. And we'll, I'll show some better pictures on the evolution and formation of martensite. And then around the martensite, we actually have retained austenite because there was not enough time given in the cooling of this microstructure to allow for carbon to diffuse out of the austenite and form a equilibrium condition. As I'd mentioned, austenite is FCC. So if we, what that really means is face centered cubic. If we have a cube, there's an iron atom at each corner and one iron atom in each face. And FCC is kind of a fantastic phase because there's a whole bunch of open space in around each of these iron atoms that we can accommodate carbon, molybdenum, chrome, niobium, and vanadium, all sorts of alloying elements that can go into solution in austenite. And when we cool them down rapidly, we trap them in those open spaces and take to form martensite. And even they're stuck in those spaces inside martensite, which wants to be smaller. And it puts some strain in the lattice, which increases the strength of our martensite even more so. So then our other phase of is ferrite, which is BCC. So in ferrite, we have an iron atom at each corner and one atom of iron in the center of our cubic structure. So the other thing about ferrite is that it's not as quite as densely packed. And so it doesn't accommodate stress and deformation as easily as that of ferrite. And we're, I'll talk about that in the next slide, why that's important to us as blacksmiths and why, and part of the reason it's easier to forge at higher temperatures versus cold working at low temperatures. And then the third phase that we've mostly been talking about is cementite. And the reason um, I haven't put up cementite is it's orthorhombic and I don't really wanna throw out even more structures and parts of metallurgy that I don't have time to cover. So I'm just gonna tell you for now that it's orthorhombic Trust me about that, and we'll continue moving forward with our metallurgy discussion. Um, so why it's important to know about these crystal structures is that all of these atoms that are arranged in a cube, you then arrange those cubes in a grid, and you get a, per a perfect lattice or array of atoms that can stretch on for infinity in an idealized world. In reality, those grains, are of a limited size and you start to run into stacking effects or stacking faults where the atoms don't line up perfectly against one another. And that's what gives you your grain boundaries where atoms aren't lining up correctly in your lattice. Another way that we create stacking faults 
is through forging. And this can happen in both austenite and in ferrite and all crystallographic systems that we form what's called a dislocation. This is a defect in our crystal lattice where we have an additional plane inserted and that pushes our original structure apart and induces some strain. This is the way that when we're forging and hitting on our steel, the atoms are moving to accommodate the energy we're imparting. And they're making all of these dislocations, thousands and thousands and thousands, in order to change the shape of the steel as we impart energy. And with austenite, we have a really close packed structure. It's really easy for one atom to move to a new space in our structure and a new space again. And so it's easy to accommodate the movement of these dislocations through the microstructure as you create more of them. Whereas in ferrite in the BCC microstructure, there's a larger space for the atom to move to the next location. And it takes a little bit more energy to cause that movement to happen. Uh, so this is one reason why cold working steels is more difficult is it requires more energy as well as you don't have the thermal aspect to aid in the movement of atoms that you would have in an austenite system. So at the macro scale, when we take our bar and forge it down, we've got these very big grains that we can think of as uh, to some degree, each one of these grains has this perfect lattice. And then when we deform it, we form a whole bunch of these defects and these defects pile up and run into each other. And you get more and more defects, which then makes it so that the lattices aren't lining up and you get very small grains. And if you were to stop forging, say the end of this tenon, but it stays at higher temperature, these defects are gonna match up and you might have a defect here and a defect down below that move together and combine to reform a perfect crystal. And that is what occurs to start growing our grain structure. And then with even more time and temperature and not forging, we're starting to increase our grain sizes. More and more of those defects come together and our grains combine sort of like soap bubbles. Which, when we start to think about this process in terms of creating a strong material, we want to have some of these smaller grains because these small grain sizes give us higher strengths. It's more of a difficult path for a crack to propagate through, which helps us in having a high strength material. So, I've started talking about strength, ductility toughness and hardness throughout today. So I'm gonna give a quick view into a stress strain diagram. If we look at our red material, I would call this a high strength material. Um, the end of each of these lines is going to be our ultimate tensile strength. And this is all where our part is breaking. So where your, your piece of steel is tearing, or in this red line, this is very typical of a glass where you're applying deformation which is denoted by strain. So you're, you're uh, stretching or changing the shape and it, it is slowly accommodating it as stress or your force builds and builds and builds until the point where the microstructure can no longer accommodate strain and it fractures. So this is a high strength material, but it's gonna be low in ductility. We don't have much deformation occurring before the red line or our glass fractures. So if we were to look at something maybe more akin to a, a quench and tempered steel, we're going to see that we have a pretty high ultimate fracture strength, but not a ton of ductility. And we have an interesting point here called yielding. This is where we're changing from stretching the material and it stretches, 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 and up at this point where it yields, this is where deformation starts to occur. So every time you're forging in a material, when you actually deform the part, that is where you've exceeded the yield strength. So if you're hammering on a piece of copper, once you hit it hard enough to dent it, you've exceeded locally the yield strength. If you continue to hammer on that piece of copper, you start to work hard in it to where it hits the tensile strength, 
or the of the material and then as you continue to hit it and hit it and hit it to the point where the piece of copper fractures you hit the ultimate tensile strength so this this material has a higher ductility than our glass um, but not necessarily the highest toughness that we have shown so here in the blue curve this is our highest toughness material it's also our lowest strength we have the lowest tensile strength the lowest ultimate tensile strength but we have a significant amount of ductility we're able to accommodate a lot of deformation in the material so when we're heat treating we're wanting to end up somewhere in between here toughness is kind of the area the total area under the curve strength is how much uh, stress we can withstand and ductility is how much deformation we can withstand now hardness is another factor that many people talk about when heat treating a material Hardness in steel alloys is a pretty good representative for your tensile strength. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good. And hardness testing is really easy to conduct in the shop. Um, there's means for very small hardness testers that basically bounce a ball bearing off the surface of your part and measure the rebound to determine how hard the material is. Um, there's other uh, noop testers and different forms of hardness testers that can go from small, tiny pieces of steel all the way up to large forgings that are going to become an engine block in a submarine or something. But really, in terms of our mechanical properties, hardness is best for giving us an indication of wear resistance. So if you're laying down padding on the front engine of a dozer blade where you're going to have tons of rock and dirt passing over that steel, that you're laying down with the weld, you, you're going to be looking at higher hardness materials that can take that abrasion over time. So how do we get to that strength, toughness, and ductility? That's a lot of times what we're achieving through heat treatment through steels. And there's three primary stages. First step is austenitizing. This is when we're heating the part up above into the austenite phase field, which is above that critical temperature of the alloy. Um, if you're at the eutectoid composition, it's above 723 degrees Celsius. Uh, the next stage is our quenching. This is our rapid cooling below the martensite start temperature. So when we quench, we're cooling it, the material so fast that carbon cannot move through the microstructure. And in order to accommodate the change in size as the part wants to shrink and as the unit cell size wants to shrink, we go through a shear deformation, which is a martensite transformation. And on the right here is kind of a series of parts that were cooled past the martensite start temperature and then stopped. They were held there or completely moved to a room temperature. So here at the beginning, this is a part that was austenitized and then cooled down to just below room temperature where martensite started to form in this thin black layer. Um, this is called a lath of martensite. And then it was held at that temperature just below martensite start. And so only there's only so much energy to start to form martensite and the rest of the austenite stays present. And then uh, if you start cooling this part again, you'll form more martensite. In this, in this case, they continued cooling down to negative 60 Celsius. So that is well below freezing. Uh, it's actually negative 76 Fahrenheit. And so more martensite is starting to form in between our prior martensite plates that were already there. And as we then start cooling again to even lower temperatures, negative uh, 148 Fahrenheit, we form even more martensite within the microstructure. But you'll notice that at this low temperature, we've come to a point where basically there's no more room for martensite to form. We don't have, we can't really go colder or don't necessarily have the means to go colder. And we've hit a stop point where no longer martensite will form, but we still have austenite present. And so that's where our third stage comes in in tempering this martensite structure. Because this mar pure martensite or majority martensite structure is really high strength, does not have much ductility, therefore it has pretty low toughness and is not able to accommodate any deformation 
or much deformation, and it's not able to prevent the propagation of cracks. So that's why we temper, which is a subcritical heat treatment. So this is bringing the part back up to a temperature somewhere below 723 degrees C. And we're going to start changing the microstructure and the properties. Primarily what we're doing is allowing carbon to diffuse. So in tempering, we're reducing brittleness to increase our toughness, which gains us a lot of ability to accommodate deformation or accommodate load when we're using our part or using our tool to punch holes or cut a piece. And tempering can occur anywhere below A1, which I realized I didn't de define earlier, but that's our critical temperature that's the boundary, the lower boundary of the austenite phase field. And tempering, there's three stages that are occurring. There's carbides formation. So this is at our low temperature, low temper temperatures below about 200 degrees Celsius. So what's happening is carbon is diffusing out of the Martin site. So carbon is coming from these dark black layers and moving out of that and forming small round particles in, throughout the microstructure. That those small round particles prevent the movement of dislocations, but they also relieve some stress in the Martin site microstructure. As we continue to heat up, we have transformation of retained austenite. So what that means is the white area that's left over in these microstructures is going to start to transform to our equilibrium phases of ferrite and cementite, which are both very ductile at, or are more ductile at room temperature than martensite and can accommodate deformation better than martensite can at room temperature. When we're looking at high High carbon steels, we're going to be primarily forming cementite out of our retained austenite. And this is in what's forming in kind of the blue brittle range. And as part of the reason that blue brittleness can occur is that we're, we're forming a greater amount of cementite in the microstructure, which to some degree has lower toughness and lower ability to accommodate deformation than say ferrite. And then finally, as we start to exceed that blue brittle range. We're replacing um, some of our early first stage carbides with late stage carbides that are of even more stable form. They're a little bit larger and they're better and more able to accommodate deformation. One thing that I wanna to touch on in terms of austenitizing, this is the stage where we're trying to fully austenitize the part. We want the whole section, the whole, thickness of our part to be austenitized, such that when we quench it, we're, we're doing our best effort to allow the entire part to cool and shrink at the same rate, and prevent from having a differential in the, the shrinking of the part that can cause our part to crack during heat treatment. We also want to control the grain size of our austenite. So the way we do that is we control the time and the temperature that we dwell in the austenite phase field. We have to be in there long enough for everything to transform to austenite, but not so long that our grains grow large and give us a weaker part. We want a small, fine austenite grain so that when those are quenched, the small austenite grain makes uh, even smaller grains of martensite, which increase our strength. The last thing I wanna to touch on is for both of these regions, these are very critical to, to heat treating. We can use the heat treaters guide companion. Uh, this is a great application that you can download on your phone from either of your popular play stores. It's fantastic if you know that you're, you're steel alloy to be able to look up really rapidly what temperature should you austenitize at, what temperature should you temper at, and it even goes into some more complicated heat treating uh, procedures and it's free. So the last thing that kind of plays into that heat treating app is determining your alloy. When you look at high carbon steels, it's pretty easy to look at the iron carbon phase diagram. So if you're looking at 1000 series steels, that's like a, a 1090, 1080, 1085, you can look at the, the iron carbon phase diagram and start to get an idea, okay, if I go to 0.85% carbon for 1085 and up, what temperature will I start to be in that austenite phase field? 
when you start to look at more complicated alloys like your H13s, maybe you want to go S7 or whatever your alloy favorite alloy of choice, it starts to become more difficult to determine from junkyard steel or to know exactly what it is. So two ways you can go about verifying and pretty much every major city has a metallurgical lab that can conduct these is carbon by combustion. This might also be called alico carbon which is gonna give you primarily carbon content and maybe sulfur content. A lot of times sulfur is added to steel to aid in machining, but sulfur can reach a point where it's detrimental to both forging and heat treating. The other thing you might wanna consider is optical emission spectroscopy or OES. This is going to give you a range of composition of all of your other additional elements. So your manganese, chrome, vanadium, molybdenum, and can help you start to narrow down on what alloy your steel might be if you have an unknown composition. And a lot of labs can probably give you a, it's X, Y, or Z based off of your composition. Both of these tests are probably in the neighborhood of 50 to $75 per test and require about a one inch cube sample. The reason I bring this up is I hear all the time of blacksmiths go into a junkyard and they find a whole pile of steel bars, the same length, the same diameter that seem to be good. And they tried heat treating at home and they seem, seem really beneficial. These are two pretty cheap in the long run tests to run, um, especially if you wanna produce a, a heat treated product or tool from those junkyard steels. I highly recommend conducting some pretty basic metallurgy to figure out what your alloy composition is. The last thing I wanna point out is this, steel processing structures and performance. This is a fantastic metallurgy textbook. If you wanna learn more, this is the textbook for you. This is my last slide and I'll take any questions. So when you, when you quench um, mm -hmm. and you have, um, basically you have martensite, so you, you have your martensite or your austenite only forms above A1, right? Mm -hmm. And then you quench and you have basically martensite and retained austenite. And uh, then you, yeah. and then you temper. Mm -hmm. And when you temper, is the tempering only affecting that retained austenite or is it, re is it affecting the martensite as well? It's going to be affecting both. Okay. Um, and, and depending on your tempering temperature, I, I should say it depends. The classic answer from a metallurgist is, is it depends because your, mar your, your tempering temperature really is what's at effect there. Um, if you're tempering at lower temperatures, um, say like below 390 Fahrenheit, you're gonna be mainly affecting the martensite. As you start to move up in your tempering temperatures, um, you're going to start affecting that retained austenite more. Um, does that answer your question, John? Yeah, yeah, because ultimately they're going to break down, they're going to go through breaking down through cementite and then to ferrite, correct? To an equilibrium state of, um, eventually if you apply enough heat. Yeah, if you, I mean, if you held a quenched part at say 600 degrees, or sorry, 1000 degrees Fahrenheit for hours and hours and hours, it's going to be back to ferrite and cementite, but we're talking uh, maybe hundreds of hours. Because the, the lower the temperature, the longer duration, right? Right, so exactly. It, 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 you know, you have to substitute one or the other, but- Yes, temperature, okay. um, temperature makes a significantly more, a significantly greater impact on diffusion. And that ultimately that's what's happening in tempering is we're, we're allowing carbon to diffuse. So if you increase temperature, there's more energy for that carbon to move. It's like giving coffee to a five-year-old. Um, you're, you're giving them more energy to move by increasing temperature. And then I guess the other question that I had, uh, you were talking about um, basically sub-zero temperature, mm -hmm. temperatures. So you were talking about um, basically uh, what do they call that when they uh, when uh, they quench a cryogenic quench cryo yeah cryo cryo yeah. so so I that mean, actually forms more um, martensite where you had retained austenite it it basically allows martensite to continue to form in those yeah. 
Yes. Okay, interesting. Um, you have a martensite start temperature. This is some temperature which will vary based on carbon content and other alloying elements, um, but it's always going to be below or, or a temperature below the lowest point of our austenite. So as you increase carbon content, this austenite field gets bigger, which forces that martensite start down lower. There is also a corresponding martensite stop temperature that below that, if you're below the martensite stop temperature, no matter how far you're below it, there's no more, no longer energy to cause the shear transformation to happen. And you're not gonna form any more martensite below this temperature, below the stop. So as, you're off, as you increase carbon content and alloying elements and get into some of those fancy, uh, typically steels that they're using for knife making, what you're doing is you're pushing this martensite start temperature down and the martensite stop temperature. So if you wanna to get to a fully martensitic microstructure and eliminate your austenite to, to get the maximum hardenability, that's why you have to start moving into a cryogenic quench to get low enough in this martensite phase field to get your maximum transformation. Interesting. And which of the two structures between martensite and retained austenite is more brittle and has to be actually uh, degraded back to a, you know, your, to say your martensite. Like, martensite is? Okay. Yeah. It's your martensite. Um, and while we're on the while we're on the topic of being between that martensite start and stop temperature, if you've ever heard someone talk about um, starting their quench and then pulling their knife out and trying to straighten it during the warp, what's happening is they're cooling down, they get below the martensite stop temperature, and then they pull the part out. And theoretically, you're basically, you're stopping midway here. So what's happening to your microstructure is that You've started forming martensite. You keep forming martensite. You pull it out of the quench. This is your martens, your your microstructure. And so now, when you're out of the quench, you've got partially austenite still present. Austenite is highly deformable, and can accommodate stress and strain. So you're able to straighten out the bend. But we're cool now. We're back to cooling at ambient air cooling rates. So that austenite is gonna start transforming to ferrite and cementite. So you wanna get back into the quench to start again, forming that remaining austenite into martensite if you wanna get your hardest blade possible or your hardest part possible. Interesting. So, but if once you've gotten past your stop point, that martensite's gonna form regardless, right? If you, if you make your, your right. quench speed. So, so let's say you just quench uh, use the most aggressive quench recommended for that steel and you're quenched and your temperature is well below the martensite stop, you're going to form as much martensite in that part as is physically possible. Okay. Now, depending on the alloy, there still might be austenite retained. But even if you do an interrupted quench, say you, say you get past that threshold where you're starting to form austenite yep. and say you don't put it back into the quench if you're doing a straightening operation or something, yep. then it's going to continue to go through that process of transforming into martensite regardless of whether you quench it or not, correct? Or No, so if you interrupt your quench, if you, if you pull out of your, so if you, this image here on the left, let's say we stop quenching right here. All of this white region is our austenite that's not going to transform to martensite because okay. you no longer have, you're now, when you're out of the quench, or let's talk about an, an oil hardening steel. When you're out of, or no, let's do water because water is our fastest cooling rate. So we need, okay. that means the steel needs to cool quickly in order to form martensite. If we pull out of our water part way and we only have some martensite formed, this remaining austenite is going to transform to ferrite and cementite. Okay, because so you'll you'll have your all of that equilibrium. Okay, so your martensite will be present, but It'll the austenite will will degrade to cementite and ferrite. Yes, and then if the heat is above your tempering threshold, then it'll probably start to degrade your martensite too. It, yes, that can okay. happen as well. Interesting. Okay, cool. Uh, and uh, that's called an auto tempering or, okay. or self tempering. 
Okay, cool. They used to use that with oil quenching for like that they keep the the smoke point, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the takeaway I'm getting from that that you should not do a partial quench, straighten and re and then continue quenching. You it it depends on again, it depends, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> depends on the final properties yes, you want to achieve so um typically i would say it's best that if you're going to take out and straighten go back into the quench to finish okay. forming your martin site okay and then and then conduct your tempering but you have a narrow window of time yes yeah yeah it has yeah, to go yeah, back yeah. into the quench right because the, take longer... the retained austenite Yep, and transform it into martensite again to keep okay. moving towards that martensite stop. Because the longer you stay out in ambient air, the more of your austenite is transforming to ferrite and cementite, which aren't strengthening your blade in this example. That's cool. Okay, cool. Thanks, ma'am. Yeah. I have one, one question regarding that. Um, I don't know a lot about hardening steels, but I do know that the knife guys, when they are quenching and it works mm -hmm. and they straighten it and they interrupt and they straighten it and then they go back and they do another quench. Mm -hmm. They do this several times and apparently that's not good. What's happening to the structure when they do multiple quenches that way? So multi are they austenitizing in between? Yeah, they take it back up to, uh, you know, above oh. the A1 and then they quench a second time. And I don't know if it's grain size or something, but supposedly that is undesirable for some reason. I, I love this. This is fantastic. I get to say it depends again. <laughs> that's, that's fine. It's a valid answer. <laughs> um, the reason I say it depends is when, when you heat up to austenitize again, you could be heating up from really small grains of martensite, right? Which yep. are going to... Once again, they'll, find, they'll form austenite that'll be slightly larger. But what the concern is, is that if you don't have a lot of control over that reheat in terms of temperature or time you spend at that temperature, you might be going into a region where you start with really fine or fairly fine grains of austenite, but if you stay in the furnace too long, the grains grow bigger and grow even bigger. And where that harms you, is that the larger your austenite grain size that you are quenching from, is oh, going to mean cracks. you have not necessarily cracks, but you'll have oh, larger propagation. packet, larger size martensite. And the larger the packet of martensite, the uh, the lower strength it has, and to your point, the lower ability it has to resist cracking. All right, no, I got you. That makes sense. Thank you. Yep. I, okay, I have one more question. You didn't cover this, uh, but <clears throat> the difference between an, annealing and normalizing and yep. um, normalizing, when you look at the guys that talk about um, knife making, they talk about thermal cycling, three to five cycles, mm -hmm. um, like just slightly above critical, at critical, slightly slightly below, et cetera. And that does, that um, refines your grain structure is what they, they say. But could you kind of, explain a little bit between normalizing and thermal cycling and, and annealing and, and kind of the differentiation because my understanding is that the longer uh, duration that you have in a, an insulated environment where you're extending the um, you know the, the duration at at temperature you will have um, a, a diffusion that leads to uh, austenite, or I'm sorry, to uh, cementite and ferrite, but a larger grain structure, um, and that would describe annealing. And then if you have a shorter duration, then you still degrade down to um, cementite and ferrite, mm -hmm. but the grain structure will be smaller. Is that, is that, am I understanding that properly or like yeah. what's going on? Yeah. And um you're totally, I think you're right on the nose there, John, okay. in terms of your understanding of both of those uh, uh, annealing and normalizing processes. Um, sometimes the reason why you might cycle up to austenite and then let it cool down and then cycle up again and repeat several anneal cycles. Sorry, I got to check myself because I always switch annealing and normalizing. But if, you're, if you go up to austenite, you take it out, let it cool down in air repeatedly. What they might be trying to do there is make sure 
that they're allowing for all of their dislocations to diffuse out to the grain boundaries or meet up and relieve the structure and get as perfect of a structure as possible with allow, without allowing any grain growth to occur. I see. Okay. So because what you're doing in both annealing and normalizing is you're basically taking your dislocations, you're allowing them to pack back into a cubic matrix instead of a, yes. uh, a random uh, arrangement from your, you know, your deformation or whatever, but you're yeah. basically allowing it to, to, to pack back into a cubic lattice. Right. Yep. And if you do not let that temperature raise beyond a certain threshold and you do not allow that duration to extend beyond a certain threshold, then you will not experience grain growth. So that thermal cycling is allowing for your dislocations to, um, Recombine. To create a yeah to to reorient themselves to a regular orientation yep. without having a a a commensurate like um, grain growth grain growth okay cool yep. and and what's happening when dislocations are are, are matching up it, it's called annihilation because you've oh. got a an extra plane half plane here on the right and uh, an extra okay. half plane here on the top in the left. Let's say this is all within the same grain. As they move towards each other, they'll eventually meet up in the center here, and you'll have a regular structure again. Okay. And those two meet up. Interesting. And that you're you're it's an, an annihilation, and this typically happens mostly at grain boundaries. It happens some in the bulk, but um, typically your dislocations are moving towards grain boundaries and or along grain boundaries. Okay. Cool. Thanks, man. That 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 really helps me to understand a few of the things that have just been kind of big question marks for me. Yep. And right. one, one more quick question too. So does grain growth only occur when you're like above the critical temperature when it's Yes. You okay. have to be you have to be up in your austenite phase field. Or well, let's see. You have to have some austenite presence. So uh, in this iron carbon phase diagram. Yeah. It's going to be above 723 degrees C, this horizontal line here, right? Because okay. there's some austenite present here, some austenite present here. You're somewhere above that temperature. Okay. Yeah, I got it. Thank you.